If you've ever seen the movie comedy Men Who Stare at Goats with a host of bright stars like George Clooney and such in it, you'll probably remember that it was a comedy based allegedly upon a true account of the American military's dabbling into the paranormal to look for real-world weapons applications. The movie parodies this program to the point of ridiculousness, and for many in this paradigm we live in, it is the stuff of crazy people. It is not a subject that I am even comfortable speaking about as I will here, because there's a much deeper reality to it than most perceive, and in places I only barely touch that. Things have happened in the course of my MK Ultra experience that I cannot fully account for, and I have the damnedest times even getting people to listen or understand the parts that are concrete, solid, and easily explained about this program. It is a very documented and known program, even though the government and the personage of CIA Director Richard Helms had destroyed the bulk of the files and records of the people they used and experimented on back in 1973, just prior to being investigated in a congressional hearing. I was one of these people. This hearing was instigated by the many victims of this program and their doctors after it had become known via the Freedom of Information Act that they were not delusional about the things they claimed to be disabled them in one form or another. For an ultra like me, it represented validation and acceptance into the normal world when people would understand something of how I got this way and not just think I was nuts. No matter how many times I showed off doing the things that most people thought were crazy or just one of those things or impossible and performed them time after time and after time and again, it couldn't possibly have be, been because I was worked over in a secret government black project at a well-known local hospital. That was a delusion. And though I was talented and nearly indestructible, I was merely a, a lucky fool and that was that. Crazy people can be abnormally strong and appear to be rational in their insanity. Being a known martial arts master of over 50 years experience and exposure as a teacher to very many people in countless exhibitions, a lot of what I do is relegated to those weird, unexplainable things that Shaolin monks are capable of doing in chopsaki flicks, and this is an acceptable explanation for my abnormalities to many. I could tell people potential students that I can teach and condition them to be able to do many of the things that they've seen me do. But most back away from that offer with no little fear in their eyes. They can't imagine that I might be right, though I have taught and helped condition some exceptional students to do just that. This is not a grandiose or delusional promise made by a madman. I am not merely a black belt karate instructor. I am a master teacher of my skill sets. I am widely known by many other master teachers of various martial disciplines by name, face, or reputation. No matter what Richard Helms has destroyed of my past records, I exist and I am a fully capable super soldier, if that's what you want to call us. And around the city I've spent the larger portion of my life in and around the globe where I've visited, there are many witnesses to deeds that you will no doubt describe as larger than life. Those are my normal as an MK Ultra survivor. Until a number of years ago, especially after the fiasco of the congressional hearing on this program that I had such high hopes for, this was not a topic that I cared to discuss much. I'm sensitive on, on levels that those cannot, most cannot begin to comprehend, and the stories draw the same reaction of this poor fool is delusional. I would say if you ever harbored the idea that yourself and a gang of 20 of your toughest friends could survive for longer than five minutes in a locked room with me at my worst, it is not I that is delusional. What I have done in full out combat fighting under worse circumstances than you can imagine is not imaginary. No soldier can ever forget such experiences and it leaves a mark on them forever. That's not delusional. That's called PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. You may be saying even now that it's just not possible for anyone to do the things that we give personal testimony about in these interviews and such. 
I say it is not possible for you to do these things. Nobody ever trained and traumatized you to fight for your life or die trying and let you watch your peers wind up dead or worse for trying and failing. But for many of us, life has never allowed us the comforts and securities that you can take for granted. There's a life and death reason why the government destroyed the records of the atrocities they committed upon these American children. They fear being put to death for the sheer magnitude of their crimes. <coughs> From around 2005, some longtime friends kept telling me about the testimonies of a man named Duncan O'Finian that they perused on the internet speaking of the MK Ultra program. Dude, this guy looks and sounds so much like you that it can't be a coincidence. The name never really rang a bell at the time. I was working on my Witch Clan fantasy series and very busy writing and too busy to get my hopes up that anyone will ever be able to see and understand what has happened to my life here. But they never relented and eventually I took the time to view one of his Project Camelot interviews. The name didn't ring a bell at the time, but he talked about things that nobody but a survivor of that program could know. And I knew that face and build from an early age when he spoke of spending summers with a favorite uncle and coming back home with skill sets that he couldn't explain. I understood exactly what happened in great detail. When I saw videos of him working techniques that he had no knowledge of how he learned it, I knew exactly where and how he learned them. And I knew from whom he learned them. Well, at least some of them, not all, he learned from me. Who was also reportedly spending a summer with a favorite uncle. Except that I knew where I was and what I was doing for the lion's share of that time span. For me, my skill sets came from a number of master teachers as well, and I've had some of the best in the world. And when I objected to certain types of missions, I had to earn my keep to prevent me from being relegated to the types of institutions and cruel experimentations that the throwaways in this program wound up in. I would constantly be reminded of how much money was invested in me and that they expected a full return for their investment. I was never referred to as a person, but an asset, a piece of government property. So I shared my training with others in the Ultra programs, Deltas, Rangers, Recons, Green Berets, and etc., who were also used in deadly clandestine missions. Duncan was about seven years my junior, and he had an exceptional focus when he took in his lessons, as if his life depended upon every last detail. It did. And like me, if he failed, it would not be pleasant at all, and death would probably be a better end than what we could anticipate in this monstrous life we were forced into. In so many ways, he was more a brother than my little brother was, because I could relate on the deepest levels what motivated him and understood him like I understood my own soul. Now, if I wanted a hook to draw my audience into this lengthy diatribe, I probably should have put this part in the first paragraph to help hold your attention. But I really have long lost any cares about getting the average herd mentality MK sheeple to understand this part of my life. You just can't make somebody understand or relate. If you're that interested in going this far into my essay here, then you'll probably have more than just an idea. I've managed to make a few people see and look into some of these things, and they're beginning to see that I've more than a small clue of what I've been talking about all this time about super soldiers from these programs. There's a lot of really bizarre testimonies from other ultras and such from these programs that just go well beyond weird. What troubles me the most is that I can't really tell you for a fact that they are delusional in what they are claiming. The fact is, there's some really weird shit going on in these programs that I can't give an easy an explanation as some of the other things I've claimed and shown in some of my YouTube clips or demonstrated in martial arts exhibitions, and I want to touch upon some of that. See, it's not really for your benefits that I do, but for mine. I've learned that it's when I take the time to put vague thoughts and notions into structured language that they begin to be clear for me and better understood. 
I just can't trust myself to the machinations of any old head shrinker, as my lifetime has been one of abuse from some of the brightest monsters in modern psychiatry in our lifetime. I am speaking of people like Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, Dr. Ewan Cameron, Dr. George Estabrooks from Colgate Rochester here in, in, in town, Dr. Michael Orn or Dr. Louis Julian West, and many others through the Rockefeller's eugenics group and CIA black programs in Building 400 on the University of Rochester Medical Center campus. You probably have no idea how much danger I brought upon myself naming those names and places. But I've been in life-threatening situations most of my life as a matter of course. In the, in the realm of priorities and fear factors, it ranks right up there with today is Tuesday. But I know some of you will check through other credible sources and that you will find that this is not some mental aberration, but solid historical fact. No matter how many records Helms has destroyed, there are many other records that place these men's and projects in this area at these times. I know because I was there and I was an exceptional prodigy of a test subject. I will be getting into the men staring at goats part of this story eventually here. But I don't want to leave you with the ridiculous comedic pictures that the, that the movie was designed to make you imagine when such things get brought up by whistleblowers and such. I want you to have a real understanding of how such things really came about in the course of these black projects experiments on real American children in this country and in others. It was a funny movie and I enjoyed laughing at it too. I really did. I'm not cutting it down. But it is not the reality what these experiments entailed upon those of us they were imposed upon. I did not volunteer. I had only two choices of very, very bad or much, much worse if I didn't allow these things to be done to me. That was not the least bit funny. It scarred us in ways that most will never understand, sometimes even literally. I've explained in some of my testimonies about how they strengthen and harden our skeletal structures to incredible disease, degrees through a known physical process known as Wolf's Law. I've also described how the trauma made us accelerate faster via adrenaline overloads and how they made our musculature much denser and stronger through strong electrical shocks being pulsed and spread through various muscle groups. I've mentioned the increased intelligence and genius IQs found in the most successful of us, but not so much of how that was accomplished in us. I briefly mentioned being used in remote viewing and even some techniques as to how that may be done by many of you and maybe a little bit about forcing us out of our bodies to gain input by immersing us into sensory deprivation tanks. If you do your own research on these things, you will find many of your own links leading back to the MKUltra and related projects and universities that participated in them as well. I didn't say much about how they'd scar our brain stems to increase the likelihood of such phenomenon in us. I was inducted into this program almost immediately after I was born on July 31st, 1953. It was a Friday. On the back of my neck is something my mother always described as my strawberries, or a birthmark. They change color with the seasons, I'm told. But I've got three or four birthmarks on a few parts of my body that are different in appearance and nature than these. These are from doctors you know, those saintly men you worship as paragons of humanity, purposely scarring this infant's brain stem to increase our capacity for having a photographic or eidetic memory. Most people can only remember back to about eight or nine years old in their lives, if that. I remember back all of my life. I remember nearly everything I've ever seen or read at any age. My personal concept of time is not linear or sequential. I remember everything as if they only happened a week ago. It doesn't apply that I understood every last thing, but it is a permanent part of my memory of my lifetime and my own awareness. But for little islands of all too brief happiness, love, and security, 
It is a virtual sea of darkness, fear, anxiety, stress, and deadly violence. That is the life I adapted to, to survive and try to grow into my own man through. I cannot begin to describe the bone-shivering dread that overwhelms me when I see those places and relive those times in my memories. But like before, I struggle to overcome them because I must. There is no hope for me at all if I don't. Failure is not an option that anyone wants to contemplate in an environment such as MK Ultra has forced us to endure. And as rough as my life has been and is now, I still feel most fortunate to command my own soul to this day and time. It is my hope that many of you will find your own for yourselves by considering what some of the things I am speaking freely about here relate to you and yours. I want to come back to the most bizarre experiments alluded to in staring at goats. <coughs> Excuse me. And for that I need to come back to my brother-in-arms Duncan O'Finian. My little brother from another mother as I like to say. Now this is not to be condescending towards him in any way. In very profound ways he is like a hero to me for his speaking out and reliving every time he shares his experience to what amounts to a crowd of bored fools looking for an enthralling tale to tickle their ears, all in the hopes of reaching that one or two souls in that crowd for whom the little light comes on when he touches upon the proper sequence for them. His speaking has goaded me to re-examine some things that I have long put on the back burner ages ago and didn't want to revisit unless I could get something productive out of the anxiety it causes just to look at it again. I'm sure there are a myriad of veterans out there who can relate to never ever talking about the things they see and relive again and again in their nightmares. People like to say, people inexperienced like to say, talk about them, get them out again, it's good for you. No, it's not good at all. And those things that burn themselves that intensely into your brain never lessen or decrease. And their impact, no matter how often you speak or relive them or how much time has passed, that is the difference between something that gives you PTSD and just another bad day at the office. Duncan and Dave Corso another ultra from the early days of this program, have shared a story about an incursion into Cambodia at the time when Nixon was telling the world that we had no people in Cambodia or Laos. That test, in that testimony, they speak of a group of little more than ultra children had joined hands and created a killing field that extended quite a ways out from their pickup point via helicopter. I know how absolutely delusional that may sound to nearly all of you, it is far too fantastic or incredible to believe. I would say these men should be wearing monogram straight jackets in a high rent rubber room, except I know something about this that I've hardly ever shared and barely understood myself. See, I too have been on missions in Cambodia back in those days. My mission was twofold. It was known that the Viet Cong were crossing the border from their Ho Chi Minh Trail to avoid the American troops trying to break their supply lines. A number of highly trained ultras and similar ops were hidden in the jungles and creating our own terror upon the troops by quietly and covertly decimating their numbers in highly unconventional ways. My particular forte was in ninja tactics. This is not an extravagant fantasy claim. This is a skill that I have been known to possess and teach for many decades. When a Viet Cong would fall too far behind the group or become separated, they would be yanked into the jungle shadows only to be found much later with their necks broken and their heads facing the wrong directions on their corpses. As grisly as this seems, it had assured that they were truly dead and not just paralyzed by the broken neck to speak about it later as it constricted their windpipe shut in the twisting of the neck. It helped serve to help make them fearful of crossing into Cambodian or Laotian territory to continue carrying their war to us in South Vietnam. There was also the well-funded and armed Khmer Rouge to consider. The Cambodian nationals needed my specific training 
in being able to combat and arm themselves from Khmer Rouge weapons and stockpiles, since we couldn't just outright fund and supply them to fight their end of their own war. But after the idiotic multiple U.S. bombings of Battambang, I became problematic about having anything to do with the monstrous killings of civilians as collateral damage, and that we especially had no rights to carry out on a people we were not legitimately at war with. For my portion of mind control to fight and kill I, as I did in good conscience, I had to believe in what I was doing was to help people in some way. I can kill murdering bastards all day long and not lose a moment's sleep over it. My strikes are as surgical as they can get. But this was atrocious. So to keep their investments paying off in deadly premiums, I was offered the option of joining forces with a few alphabet agencies in tracking down and killing some of the more notorious drug cartels in Central America. This had the added benefit of being able to spend more time at home with my karate studios after only a couple of weeks at a time out in the field. This was in the 1976-77 term of CIA Director George H.W. Bush, and I was attached to a professional mercenary group, contractors, known as the Disney Tunes. My call sign was Thumper. Well, that could have been worse. Towards the end of my actions there, I had the distinct feeling that I was being set up and sold out, as sometimes our marks would know we were coming and from what directions. In one such campaign, my luck ran out and I was captured near the Mexican border where Belize and Guatemala touch it. I do not have a recollection of how much time had passed, but I was chained naked to a metal box springs and shocked with electrical probes and worked over with a golf club, a putter, in fact. In my mind, I simply went to another place as I had been conditioned to do since I was a baby when awful things were happening to me. I'm sure there are some of you who understand how this happens. You did not come to this unpleasant way of understanding through any easy means. I'd come back when they were finished or tired of whipping on the proverbial dead horse as it were, and I'd grip the edges of the bed springs and work the metal until it fatigued enough to break and slip my bindings loose enough to get myself free. I was in very bad shape from my trials there and hadn't eaten or drank in I don't know how long, but I remember fully sneaking up and killing two men in the hacienda that I was being held in. I made it quick and lethal, especially so because I was weak and depleted and hadn't much hope that I could sustain much of a good fight outrightly on the two professional killers who had held me captive. I only remember killing the two. I was being held in a populated remote compound. I do not recall how I got completely out of it. I remember walking through a lot of wilderness like I was on autopilot, one foot in front of the other endlessly until I came to a place where I could be picked up and get help. It was some time before my unit told me that the cleaning ladies, as we call them, went in to clean out the nest that I was held in, only to find that every last person in that place was already deader than disco when they got there. Somehow, some part of me took over and finished the job that I in no way had the physical strength left to do alone at that time. I had wondered about that for many years with no idea, until I heard Duncan and Dave relate their story of the Cambodian incursion. Now listen, even then, I did not want to accept or believe it, but this is not the kind of thing that any man would forget except that I did forget certain key parts of it. I examined many of the aspects of my training and conditioning in the parts that I fully remember of MK Ultra, and I'm looking for things that somehow correspond to this kind of killing. Now that goofy movie, Men Who Stare at Goats, comes to mind, but that is hardly the lighthearted, goofy memories that I have of this kind of conditioning. Most of our training and such was trauma-based. We were made to be terrified of the results if we failed to accomplish the things we were commanded to do. There are fates worse than death, and we knew all of them intimately. To get me to leave my body to remote view or astral project, if you will, 
I was locked in a sensory deprivation tank until the only way to escape the blackness of non-existence, I had to reach out of myself, back into the realms of light and input, and be able to describe things that could be proven by my master's research or target areas. To remote view or psychically attack, track down a criminal and take him out, I had to see a file, photos, and information peculiar to that one person and obsess over them day and night to think as they would think and to see what they would see and to know intimately those motives they had to do the things they were known to do. I would know where they were at moment by moment and track them down and my life would not be free of them until they were dead. This is not your typical new age blissful way to learn these skills. It is all dark and traumatic and indelibly printed upon all of us who survived them. So it stands to reason that we did not simply sit in a room and stare at goats until they died. We had to have some kind of urgent, life-threatening connections in order to generate that kind of response. Everything in nature is cause and effect, not mere whim and a command given, but darker and deeper. Now this is the part of the essay that is my version of therapy to help me make either explain or at least make some sense of the more bizarre aspects of my experiences. This is where I search all of those painful memories for something that sheds some light in all of those deep dark places in my life experience in this present paradigm. What parts of those strange and evil experiment, experiences would be needed to condition a person such as I to be able to do such incredible things. It may help you to figure out what parts of these super soldier testimonies are credible for yourselves or not. But actually this is for my own benefit, to get a few more things out of those dark places and into the light where I can better understand them for myself. It is not an easy life living with so much pain and darkness in it. I have to be able to reconcile myself with all that I can uncover of it. As I said earlier in this, just because I remember nearly everything, it doesn't mean that I understand all of it. I just store it away until I have more information to weigh it with at a later date. This is one of those times for me. As you are looking into these things too, I'll share what I can. Try not to tell me what you think really happened. You have no clue how far this has gone and what I or the others have lived through. This is me trying to heal myself of yet another grievous personal injury. I have lived a large portion of my life alone in the dark and I've learned to rely on the one person who has always had my best interest and in survival at heart. Me. I focus on the things that made remote viewing a mark to their death. The intensity and obsessive focus and trauma that pushed me beyond myself to do these things as if it were natural for me. Staring at an animal or a person to death without touching them merely by merely focusing on it is far too trivial th a thing to make that kind of connection work to any appreciable degree. I know that because it almost never has happened like that before for me. I remember the things and images of my early childhood where fear or trauma-based connections were begun and made. I remember being locked in a dark, nasty old rat and spider infested basement as a punishment for some slight on my part as a boy. Alone in the dark, but this was unlike the tank because I could sense the lights of nearly every living creature in the house. I knew the moment when grandma would get home and let me out. I knew there were others in the house and I knew where they were, whether I could see them or not, and where all the rats and spiders were crawling. I had found a wounded mallard duck in my grandma's backyard one autumn, and it came to me and I befriended it and I called him Ducky Boy. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course I wanted to keep him. My stepfather wanted to eat him but I was determined to be his protector until he could heal. He apparently got a bullet through the wing. So as the weather got quite cold, we kept him in my grandma's basement. 
It was one of those old converted from coal to oil furnaces and still had the rough hewn wooden bin and chute where the coal used to be delivered. It was a very dark place with a single weak light bulb to light it and of course nobody wanted to pay the electric bill to keep it lit all the time. And when the house was quiet and there was nobody there to protect the duck, the rats tried their best to get to him. Big city sewer rats. When I was aware of his distress, I would come down and sit with them in the dark and keep them at bay. I learned to despise them, and I didn't like the spiders much either. They all served to make both his and my life more difficult to protect, or to be nice enough to consider ourselves as living well, and not just more hell in the dark. I had learned early in my craft lessons that anything I could feel, I could transmit to others. Fear, infatuation, pain, and all of these came most naturally for me. I couldn't let the cats into the basement to get the rats because they would also be interested in the duck. I could keep them away with fear or the threat of pain, but I had to leave them alone down there sometime and they'd be back at them again and again until they had them worn down enough to eat them. The only way to save the duck was to kill the rats. Now setting traps and poisons would only make it more dangerous for him too. And I learned something else to make the rats dead. I remember how badly it made the basement stink after they died down there. Eventually my stepfather, under the guise of setting Ducky Boy free, sold him to a Puerto Rican man to cook and eat. Not that I could really fault that over much, but I digress. The next step in the con conditioning came hating reptiles and such. Looking back I find this unreasonable and unacceptable, but such is not what I was taught and conditioned for at the time. I was tormented in many nightmares with a seven foot tall frogman, not the scuba type, who would grab me and try to drag me down into my grandmother's basement. It made a good night's sleep hard to come by and I always had these dark circles under my eyes from so much of this sort of thing back then. It was hard to live and be sociable around people who could not understand these things. So I sought out the wilderness areas by the Genesee River, the swamps and woods around Durand Eastman and Seneca Parks. And seeing the frogs there looking at me as if they knew what the monster frogmen wanted to do to me, well, let's just say there were a lot of amphibian carcasses for the snapping turtles and herons to eat floating around back then. I think from these and experience like these is where I learned to reach deep within and find the inspiration to kill to preserve myself or those that I loved. There are a good deal more dreams and instances where my fears and phobias were preyed upon until I found it within me to conquer them, but it would simply make this essay all the more tedious and verbose to endure. It was also at this time when my doctors and handlers began treating me more with kid gloves, as if I were some kind of venomous serpent that they had to be careful about getting past a certain point of fear or dread. For me, I knew if I could kill it, I had no good reason to fear it. I hated fear. Whereas certain creatures like themselves seemed to feed on all that terror and fear, I hated the taste and smell of it, and even less so in myself. Now Duncan had mentioned to me in times past that this sort of killing field was stored in some aspect of our altars, or alternate personalities, and programmed to be initiated only in specific instances and be virtually unreachable to any, uh, us any other way. There are a number of trigger mechanisms that MKUltra used in a lot of us. These are usually trigger mechanisms that we are not likely to run across in day-to-day -day life. You know, it could be a sentence like, please keep the rhinoceros off the couch you know how he sheds. This is something you'll never hear anybody say. And this is designed to get us to go into a certain level of programming and execute it. Uh, sometimes it'll be tones or, or, or any of a number of things brought out to trigger us. Well, evidently what he meant is something in our situation triggered us as a last ditch effort to generate this killing field. How is it that we can speak about the things that we've done and, and about these programs and not be murdered by the spooks for it? It is obviously not fantasy because if you're really paying attention to this and not just some shill trying to find any lame excuse to allegedly debunk it, 
you'll know there's plenty enough evidence to suggest we at least know or understand intimately the things we are telling you. Back when I was trying to disassociate myself from my murderous masters, they sent a few spooks to lean on me. I defended myself and left their easily identifiable identifiable bodies laying about where certain officials would be asking very pointed and diplomatically sensitive and embarrassing questions. For me, that wasn't more difficult to exp th than a training exercise. But what kind of threat would trigger an even more difficult to explain killing field? I'll bet they've plenty to fear on those accounts and tread very lightly. We could leave more bodies laying about than the Jonestown m massacre and not even be aware that we were triggered to it. And that field was very selective in who was affected in Duncan and Dave's experience in Cambodia. You'll note the people piloting the chopper and the people they were trying to extract from, from trouble were not affected by it, but the surrounding hostiles were. For myself, at the very least, the entire compound where I was held and tortured was decimated to the last man. I hadn't heard of anyone else locally was affected by this or not, but my tormentors never survived. Though I often wonder why it didn't trigger while or before they all got, got all too busy torturing me. But I'm sure that I have much more to re-examine and to explore to find and claim my own control over that piece of programming as I have with most of the rest of it. Who knows how much more I'll discover hidden away inside. For yourselves anyway, this will be an interesting story. You're welcome to it.